Today's reading is taken from Revelation chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1, to the church in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favour. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sarah. It is a special joy for us to have Anne Graham Lotz here at this 125th convention. Uh, whilst Anne's been amongst us, I know she's been enjoying something of the beauty of the Lake District, and so far I think she does believe that this is the kind of weather we have the whole time in England. <laughs> but we've especially enjoyed her contribution already at the convention. Uh, Anne is a mother of three. She was brought up in North Carolina, where she exercised the ministry uh, in her church and more widely but over these past years has been traveling globally, encouraging God's people, particularly in the area of our personal walk with God, the challenge to live our lives wholeheartedly. We've been so thankful for her contributions in various ways while she's been here, and she's here for a few more days before then traveling on to Amsterdam, where, as you know, there'll be a large congress of 10,000 evangelists beginning next week, for which we will pray, uh, hosted by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. We're especially glad that uh, Anne is amongst us, and we're going to invite her now to uh, pray for us all and then to speak. So please, let's welcome her most warmly. Thank you so much. It's um, such a privilege for me to be here, and I want you to know that I know that. <laughs> And it would be a privilege just to be there um, at this great convention. I've heard about Keswick, I feel like, all of my life. And there are great teachers that have been, um, what I associate with Keswick, that have meant a lot to me in my own walk with the Lord. Um, Stephen Alford and Stuart Briscoe, Alan Redpath, Michael Bond, uh, different ones, John Stott, of course, whom we've had this last week, different ones who have ministered to me in my walk of faith. And, and it's just a privilege to see the tent, to see the town, to hear the place that I've heard of for so long. To be here on this place, on this platform, is um, a high privilege, and I feel very humbled by it, and I feel very inadequate for the task, uh, but thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit who is adequate, and how many times, you know, he opens a door for us, and, and I've said, Lord, I can't do it, and he says, that's all right, and I know that, but I can, you know, just walk through it. <laughs> so we're going to uh, walk through it, uh, just clutching tightly to him, but I want to thank you for coming, and I arrived last week and know something of what it feels like to travel in and be sorted out in your wherever you're staying and uh, to still feel a little of the vibration from the trip and you feel a little frazzled perhaps. Um, so I'm just going to pray that the Spirit will quiet us all down, that we'll be able to hear Him speak to our hearts tonight. So would you pray with me please before we begin. And Father, we do bow before you and worship and praise. You are in this place and you are awesome. And we want to thank you for being in this tent, waiting to meet with us. And we feel that tonight is a divine appointment. And we've come from so many different directions and different circumstances and different places. And Lord, perhaps some of us haven't even settled in yet. We couldn't get in where we were supposed to stay or things haven't been unpacked yet. Maybe we haven't had supper and yet we're here because we want to hear from you. 
And so we thank you that not only we are here, but you are here, and we're asking now that you're going to speak to us. And Lord, whether it's because of the words that are spoken or in spite of them, we ask that each person who's in the tent will hear that still, small voice of the Spirit speaking to his or her heart. And Lord, I pray that we would be receptive, that we would understand what you're saying, that we would receive what you're saying, that we would act on what you're saying, that we would leave this tent different than when we came in. So we just commit this time to you. We lift it up. We ask for the fullness of your blessing upon it. And if you don't bless us, we won't be blessed because all blessing comes from you. So Lord, pour it out, we pray, in the name of Jesus and for his glory alone. Amen. In 1859, there was a revival that broke out in Northern Ireland, swept through Wales, went through Scotland and England, and as a result, there were thousands of people who were convicted of sin, who repented of sin, who placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, and their lives were transformed. And now in the year 2000, and if you count a generation of by 40 years, so we would say maybe three generations later, where is the impact? And I've traveled in the United Kingdom earlier this year, last year, and see something here that I see something, see the same thing at home in America, and that is that we seem as a remnant of believers to be shrinking, to be growing smaller. And we look back to revivals, but where's the revival today? And we know that Jesus promised us in Acts 1-8 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.6 that you've received the Holy Spirit. You've received the fire of God. You've received his power when I laid my hands on you at your conversion. But Timothy, it's your responsibility to fan him into flame. And I've wondered if the Holy Spirit, the fire of God and the power of God has been allowed to die out in our midst. Why? Why does it seem to be that we cannot pass the revival fires from one generation to the next? And often we can't even pass that fire on within our own home to our own children. In Roman days, people didn't have a switch where they could turn on the lights in their home and they didn't have gas to light their stove and they, they didn't have something to start their fire with. They had a central plaza in every little village and there was a fire that was kept burning. And if you wanted to light the lamps in your home or light the stove in your home, you went to the fire in the central plaza, took a brand of fire from the, the central fire, and then took it home. And that was the way you had heat and light. And the village considered that fire so important that they hired a full-time firekeeper. And the firekeeper's job was just to keep the fire burning. And if the firekeeper allowed the fire to go out for any reason, if a rainstorm came along and drenched it and it went out, or the wind came along and blew it out, or if the firekeeper just went to sleep and through neglect the fire went out, it cost the firekeeper his life because it was considered vitally important to the life of the community that the fire always be kept burning. And I believe Paul was telling Timothy, Timothy, you're the firekeeper. And you've got to make sure that the fire of the Holy Spirit is maintained in your heart and maintained in your life. And I want to lead you, if you would allow me tonight, in an examination of some of the fire quenchers in our lives and in our hearts, things that put the fire out. And of course, please understand that I understand when you receive Christ by faith as your Savior, He comes into your life in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, once He comes into your heart and life, He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You are sealed and it's irrevocable, unbreakable forever. But our sin and our disobedience can quench and grieve the Holy Spirit so that He's so quiet and still within us, we can think we've lost our salvation and the fire will go out, or at least it will be just a flicker instead of the burning flame that it's supposed to be. And in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, our Lord Jesus Christ writes letters to seven different churches, and in each one of these letters I see a fire quencher. And I'm going to take you through three of these letters. You can be very grateful we're not going to go through all seven, although I would uh, love to do that. But we're going to look at three of them because some of these are fire quenchers I found in my own life. And so I'm going to share with you personally some of the fire quenchers that I've had to deal with. The first one is in the very first letter, if you'd open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, the church 
at Ephesus. And while you're getting out your Bible, let me describe Ephesus to you. Or the church there had been pastored by the Apostle Paul. It had been pastored by the Apostle John. It was under the supervision of Timothy. And most of the people in the church at Ephesus when this letter was written had been born and raised in a Christian home. They were in their second generation of knowing Christ. And so right there, I identify with the Ephesian church because I've been exposed to outstanding Bible teachers and preachers, and I was raised in a Christian home. And I just wonder, does that apply to you? I know if you've been coming to Keswick for uh, any length of time, you've been exposed to outstanding Bible teachers and preachers, really the best that the world has to offer come and stand on this platform. And I expect just from my conversations with many of you this past week that most of you have been raised in a Christian home. You're in at least your second generation of knowing Christ. And very often when you've been exposed to outstanding Bible teaching and you have a lot of knowledge and you've been raised in the Christian home and so you're very familiar with the traditions and some of the things in the Christian faith, what our Lord saw in the Ephesian church, he may see in you also. I know he has seen it in me. And so he begins, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. And our Lord begins each one of these letters the same way by focusing the attention of the believers onto himself. It's as though he begins the letter by saying, look at me. And in this case, he's saying, look at me. I hold the stars in my right hand. And we know from the end of chapter one, the stars are the leaders of the church. And they represent you and me, so we can think of him holding you in his hand. And he says he walks amongst the lampstands. He's in our midst. And I believe he holds you and me in his right hand because he wants to use us. I hold the instruments that I use in my right hand, my pencil, my comb, my fork. And he's wanting to use you and me to glorify him, to pass the gospel on, to take the faith in Christ and pass the reality of Christ to the next generation. And he's saying, I want to use you. And I'm here in the tent tonight. I'm walking in your midst. I'm present with you. Will you look at me? And sometimes it's easy in a convention like this to look at somebody in front of you. I mean, can you believe she came? And you look across the aisle and say, I, I, he's here. I'm so glad he's here. And then you look and, you know, I can't find so-and-so. And my friend, I don't know if she showed up or not. Or, or maybe you're looking at somebody on the platform. Or maybe you just compare yourself with somebody else. And I think at the beginning of this convention, this week, our Lord would tell us, not just tonight, but every time we gather, keep your focus on Jesus. Look at me, Jesus said. And then secondly, he says, learn from me. Because he says, I know what you're doing right. And the Ephesian church was doing many things right. I know your deeds, verse 2, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered. You've endured hardships for my name. You have not grown weary. Down in verse 6, you hate what I hate. I think that describes you. I was thinking about that this afternoon. That is a wonderful description of the congregation of the Keswick Convention. And I believe the Lord would tell you this evening that he knows your deeds. He knows your hard work. He knows that you're the remnant in the United Kingdom. And he knows how busy you are, but you've made the time to draw aside and listen to his word and bring your family to this convention. And I believe the Lord, if nothing else, has brought me from America to this place to say this evening, Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, many things that you and I do for the Lord Jesus Christ, nobody else knows about, especially as a wife and mother. You know, we do a lot of things in the kitchen. We do a lot of things in the house. We do a lot of things for our children. Nobody notices, nobody thanks us. And the Lord says, I know, I know your deeds. I know you even do your housework as unto me. And then things in the church, behind the scenes, in the kitchen, in the parking lots, just turning on the lights, turning on the heat, and maybe air conditioning lately, and things like that, the administrative response. Nobody knows what you do, but the Lord says, I know. And he says, thank you. And I think this letter opens to just heaven's applause. And if the Lord would applaud you tonight, would you receive his encouragement and his commendation he knows your deeds and your hard work, and he knows what was involved to get you here tonight. He knows the sacrifices. He knows the struggle. And here you are. Nobody knows what you went through to get here tonight, but the Lord knows. And he says, thank you. Thank you for all that you're doing for me. Then secondly, he says, not only do I know what you're doing right, but 
I know something that you're doing wrong. Verse 4, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now, all three of my children got married within eight months of each other. Can you imagine? There was a lot of first love around our house. <laughs> and it's when you first fall in love with your husband or your wife. And our first love is emotional and it's passionate and it's affectionate. And when my children were falling in love, I can remember when I fell in love with my husband, you know, and you just want to be with him all the time. And I wanted to talk to him all the time. And then I just hung on every word he said and just couldn't have enough of him. In fact, when he wasn't with me, then I would talk to other people about him. I was almost obnoxious just talking to everybody about Danny Lotz and how wonderful he was. And I was in love. And when you fall in love with Jesus, it's the same, isn't it? And you just can't talk to him enough. Do you remember you used to spend hours in prayer? And that wasn't long enough. And you want to hear every word he has to say. You just hang on every word and you couldn't read enough of your Bible. And then you're almost obnoxious, telling everybody about Jesus and witnessing and sharing Christ. And when did you lose it? When did you lose being in love with Jesus? One of the impressions I have about the Ephesian church is that they were busy. All of their good deeds, all of their hard work, all of their perseverance, busy. And I wonder, did they fall in love with Jesus? So excited about their salvation and what he had done for them. And, you know, one of the things when you fall in love and you just love somebody, you want to do something for them to show them how much you love them. And so maybe these Ephesian Christians, as they fell in love with Jesus, they thought, well, I want to do something for him. And they began to serve him. And then they wanted to do something more and they wanted to serve him more. And then... Pretty soon people found out, well, you know, these people will work in the church. And so they gave them more to do and more to do until pretty soon they're so busy, they don't have time for Jesus anymore. So busy serving him, so busy working for him, they don't have time for him. And somewhere along the line, they lost their love. I taught a Bible class in my hometown for 12 years every week. Never missed a class. I was just so hungry to know God's word. And, you know, you really learn it when you have to teach it. And then God called me out of that class, and I turned it over to somebody else. But he called me to go into the world and accept invitations around the world and, and share his word in an itinerant ministry. One of the first invitations I'd received was to hold a, or to lead a pastor's conference in Fiji. Now, from where I live in the United States, that's on the other side of the world. But I went all the way down there. Um, participated in that conference, came back to America. Then I was invited to Brazil to do a pastor's conference down there. I went down to Brazil. Somebody heard I was in Brazil, so they asked me to come to a youth congress in the south part of the country. I went down and did the youth congress and came back to America. I was traveling all around, speaking, and, and I knew when I prayed, I no longer seemed to get through. And I knew when I went to church, I no longer seemed to enter into worship. I knew when I read my Bible, I no longer seemed to hear his voice, but I thought I was just tired. I thought it was just jet lag, you know, and, and then one day I was reading these verses and God seemed to speak to me. You know how it just jumps off the page and he says, Ann, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. And he went right on down the list. He knew I'd been to Fiji and you had been, and he was saying, thank you. Thank you for just wanting to share my word and bring other people into it. And Ann, I have something against you. You're losing your love for me. I just went on to the next verse. I knew that wasn't me because I went around the world telling other people how they could love Jesus. And I was sure that wasn't me. But you know, when Jesus begins to convict you about something, he just, you can't get away from that verse. He just brings you back and back to it and keeps bringing it to your mind. And finally, I listened. And I knew he had seen something in my heart that I hadn't seen in myself. And he was saying, Ann, you're losing your love for me and all of your busyness. You're not making time for me. And I can remember getting on my knees and the tears coming down my cheeks and saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. What do I do? You know, if a, and, and so he told me three things. In verse, I'll just take you step by step. Verse five, remember the height from which you've fallen, he said. And I think the pinnacle of the Christian life is being in love with Jesus. Remember the height from which you've fallen. I could remember the height. Do you remember being in love with Jesus? Do you remember what it was like to spend hours in prayer and hours in his word and share the gospel and be so excited to serve him and excited to know him? And can you remember the heights? And I could remember. And he said, Ann, remember the heights from which you've fallen, fallen in your usefulness to me, fallen in your testimony, fallen in your relationship with me. 
And then he said, repent, second thing, verse 5. And repentance means to stop it. But you know, if a first love is emotional and affectionate and passionate, and we can't control those things, how do you stop not having them? How could I get them back? And so I asked the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to repent, but how do I get back that first love? And so he said the third thing, return to the first things. Return to what you were doing at the first. And I said, Lord, what first things? And he took me back in my mind, by faith, to the cross, where I first knew Jesus as my Savior. And I was first aware of his death on the cross and what it cost him to take away my sin and bring me into that personal love relationship with himself. And I just fell on my face before him in prayer at the cross and thanked him all over again for what the Lord of glory did, leaving the throne in heaven, humbling himself, taking on the form of a servant, being obedient even to death on a cross that he might take away my sin. If nobody else had benefited, he still would have gone to the cross just for me. And he shed his own blood for my sin. And I went back to the cross. Would you do that? Just go back by faith to the cross. And then the Lord said, Ann, not only return to the first thing of the cross, but return to what you were doing at first when you were in love with me that you're not doing now. And I knew immediately what it was. And I wonder if there's somebody here can you remember what it was like to love Jesus with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength? And what were you doing then that you're not doing now? Were you spending time in prayer with him? Were you spending time reading and meditating on the scriptures? Were you spending time sharing the gospel? Were you spending time in a certain fellowship of church? What were you doing that you're not doing now? And he says, return to those first things. I'll tell you what it was for me, so you don't sit there and guess, you know. But for me, it was, I had been going around the world, giving out messages that I had already prepared. And I hadn't been doing any in-depth Bible study for myself. And that very day, I pulled out a legal pad and a pen, and I began doing a study of the book of Revelation. And this message is part of the fruit of my repentance. There's a book over in the bookstall, The Vision of His Glory. That book is a result of my repentance before God. And within a week's time, the joy was back, the sense of His presence, that awareness of His love for me. Oh, I pray to God I never again lose my first love. And I wonder if there was something that was in your life that you've let slip out like I did. Or maybe there was something that wasn't in your life when you were in love with Jesus that you've allowed to slide in. You know, it could be a habit or an attitude or a wrong relationship. In other words, just sin. And sin will kill your love for Jesus quicker than anything. And so whatever it is, maybe it's something that you've allowed to creep into your life that you need to take to the cross and just crucify it. Because whatever it is, is not worth your love relationship with Jesus, is it? And so Jesus said, Ann, I want you to remember the height from which you've fallen and repent of not loving me. And then I want you to return to the first things. And he gave me a little motivation in case I would procrastinate or hesitate. In verse 5, he says, If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The lampstand is the church. And, of course, I don't think it means he's going to physically remove the church from the neighborhood, but I think it means that he'll remove himself from the church. And I've been in many churches in America, I can tell you. You walk through the doors, and they're beautiful facilities, and, I mean, they can be fantastic in all of their um, things that they offer. But the spirit of Jesus is not there. He's left. Because they have not maintained that fire of love for him in their hearts. But I also took this personally because a lampstand is a stand on which you place a lamp and it allows the light to go in a broader spectrum. And I felt like that lampstand was my ministry that allows me to have a broader area of influence. And I felt like he was saying, Ann, if you don't put love for me back first in your heart and in your life, I'm going to dry up your ministry. And I don't have an agent or a brochure or nobody trying to get me appointments. I just trust God to open the doors, and he could dry it up just like that. And it's funny because there was a time in my life I was scared to death he would call me into service. <laughs> and then there came to a point where I was scared to death he would not call me into service. 
and I love the Lord, and I want to serve him. In order to serve him according to his will and his way, he has to open the doors for me. And he was saying, hey, and I'll shut them tight if you don't repent. And so I repented. And I just wonder, is there someone here tonight? Busy, busy, busy. So active in church. Involved in so many things. And the Lord would say, thank you. Because so many people are complacent, aren't they? So many people are apathetic. And the Lord would say, thank you for all of your busyness in my name. But I hold something against you. You're so busy serving me. You're not making time for me. You've lost your love for me. Would you repent of your lovelessness? Then he says, listen to me. Listen to what the Spirit is saying. I think there's a principle here that I'm going to give you. It's not stated flat out, but the principle is this, that our Lord Jesus Christ wants our love for him more than all of our service and obedience combined. What's the first and greatest commandment? That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he knows when we love him like that, the rest is just going to fall into place. So the principle is that love must come first. Oh, listen to me. Is there someone here who's putting your work before your worship? Would you put your worship first? And as you worship, your work flows from your worship. And the promise is this. He who has an ear, verse 7, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And the tree of life represents eternal life, which includes our love for him and his love for us and an awareness of his love. The paradise of God, that's his presence. And the promise is this, that you can eat of that tree. You can be deeply satisfied in a precious, permanent love relationship with Jesus Christ and live in an awareness of his presence. If you'll just put worship first. Do you have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying tonight? There's a fire quencher of busyness, a fire quencher of passionless service, a fire quencher of placing your work before your worship. Would you put love for Jesus back first in your life? The church at Ephesus did not listen. And I've walked through the ruins. There's no Christian church in Ephesus today. The revival fire died out. The second fire quencher, I'll take you through the other churches, just tell you what they are so you can examine them on your own. But the second one is the church at Smyrna. And I see the fire quencher of fearfulness in her life because she was so afraid of persecution and criticism she, in a pluralistic society, she was afraid of sharing the gospel. And so our Lord said, don't be afraid. And then the third one is the church at Pergamum, which I'm going to call shallowness, the fire quencher of just allowing other people to come in the church and deceive you and draw you away from simple faith in God's word. And they had people in the church at Pergamum, and I'm assuming they were preaching health and wealth and prosperity, or they were preaching some ecstatic emotional experience, or they were preaching that this book contains the Word of God, but isn't the Word of God completely from cover to cover, and they just led people away from faith in God's Word. And so there was a shallowness. In fact, this past week, John Stott was here, and he said that the Church of God is growing phenomenally all over the world, but it's growing so shallow. There's no depth. Shallowness, that's a fire quencher. You can't pass the reality of your faith in Jesus Christ to the next generation if you're shallow in your faith. It needs to be rooted in God's Word. I'm not going to go into that one with you because I feel like you don't need that one. You're here, Keswick. The next church is the church at Thyatira. If this was an American audience, I'd probably expound on this, but this is the fire quencher of permissiveness. They allowed immorality within the church until pretty soon you couldn't tell a worldling from somebody in the church. The lifestyles were so similar. And immorality, either in your life or your thought process, the things you watch on TV, the books and magazines that you read, will put the fire out. And then the next one I do want to go into briefly, the church at Sardis, chapter 3, which is the fire quencher of prayerlessness. Actually, there are two in this church, but prayerlessness and phoniness. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And Jesus begins by saying, look at me. And the picture he gives of himself is someone who's holding the balance scales. 
And on one side is the sevenfold Spirit of God, or the Holy Spirit. The other side is the church. I don't know if you've ever had somebody tell you that, you know, they believe they're going to heaven, and when they get to heaven, God will let them in because he's going to weigh their good works against their bad works. And if they've done more good things than bad things, then God will let them in heaven. And actually, they have something right in that God is going to weigh them. <laughs> But he doesn't weigh our good works against our bad works. He weighs our entire life against the perfection of the Holy Spirit. And he weighed the church at Sardis and he said, you don't measure up. And so he says, look at me. I'm the one to whom you're accountable. I'm the one who will judge your life. I'm the one who holds the scales. Are you looking? Learn from me, he says. I know what you're doing right. And we have to slip down to verse 4. And he really searched hard to find something to commend them for. But he says, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes and they walk with me. And really he was commending the church at Sardis for knowing some people who are right with him. Sort of like commending you for coming to Keswick and being surrounded by people who are right with him and that you know somebody who's right with him. He, he was looking hard. And that's the only thing he could commend them for. And the reason is because of what they were doing wrong. And it was in verse 1. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The church at Sardis was filled with Bible quoters and Bible toters, living out their Christian lives to impress other people, caring more about the opinions of other church members than caring about the opinion of God. They were phonies. They weren't real. I remember, I can remember the time, the place when God convicted me of this. It was when I was 17 years of age. Maybe there's a young person here tonight that needs to hear this, but I was so bound by the fact that I was Billy Graham's daughter. And everybody had an idea of what Billy Graham's daughter ought to be like and dress like and act like and who her friends ought to be and the places she ought to go. And they were always trying to press me into their mold. And because I didn't want to embarrass my daddy and I wanted to, you know, be an asset, I tried to please everybody. And when I was with this group, I was like one thing. And then when I was with this group, I was like another way. And I was with another group, I was that way. And just sort of like a spiritual chameleon. I just changed co colors with everybody I was with. And finally, my... In the summer of my 17th year, somebody grabbed me and said, Ann, you're looking at God through a prism, and your relationship with God is colored by everybody else's opinion. And you just need to look at God directly. And right there, on that dusty road in Southern California, I said, all right, God, I'm just going to live my life for you. And I'm not going to care what other people think. I'm just going to live my life to please you. And I know if I live my life to please you, my parents are going to be pleased, and my grandparents are going to be pleased, and the people I care most about are going to be pleased, and some people won't be pleased, but I can't please everybody anyway. So I'm just going to live my life to please you. I can't tell you what a freeing thing that was. So that tonight, as nervous as I am tonight, I, in a sense, I really don't care what you think. And I mean that, you know what I mean because I speak for an audience of one. And if I'm faithful to the message that God's put on my heart, and if I render it to the best of my ability, and I know I make a lot of mistakes, but if I just do the best I can, then God will be pleased. And if you're not, I'm sorry, and, and many of you will be. Do you understand? But it also means that if you bump into me, as some of you did out in the market square this morning, going through all of those little booths and everything, you're just going to see me like I am. I'm not going to be pretending something that I'm not. And when you bump into me at the hotel, you're just going to catch me like I am, and I'm going to be the same way here. I don't change. I mean, I might change clothes, <laughs> but I'm not going to change personalities, or I'm not going to change the way I act just because I'm here, or the marketplace, or the grocery store, or climbing down the mountain as we were this afternoon. I'm just going to be myself. And I live my life every moment to please God. Can you understand? Is there somebody here who's living your Christian life to impress other people? And I'll tell you, that's a fire quencher, especially within the home, isn't it? Because your children are the first to see it. And they see that what you're putting on is just a show for the outside world. 
And they see that you pray for people and you talk about people, but boy, when they come up to the door, you're saying all these nasty things. Then you open the door and, oh, welcome, so glad to see you. How have you been? And, and your children get the message, don't they? <laughs> I can remember my grandparents helped to raise me. You know, I was pretty much raised by single parents and uh, grandparents. And I stayed a, a lot of times, many, many nights with my grandparents. And no matter what time I got up in the morning, my grandfather was on his knees beside the rocking chair in the living room. I would catch him on his knees. I found later he got up every morning at 4.30 to pray. And I can remember my mother, late at night, wanting to slip down, discuss with her a problem, talk to her about something, finding her on her knees. And I, it didn't matter how long I stayed, it didn't matter because she was still going to be on her knees, so I'd have to slip back up to my room and come down early in the morning, I'd catch her at her desk reading her Bible. It didn't matter what time I came down in the morning, she'd be reading her Bible. I would catch them in prayer, catch them reading their Bible. Listen to me, when has your child caught you on your knees? When has your child caught you reading your Bible? When has your child caught you sharing the gospel with somebody? Do they see the reality of your faith and your love for Jesus? Or is it just a show you put on for other people? Be real. Phoniness will just quench the fire. I can remember sharing the gospel with this German couple in South Africa. My daughter and I were down there to um, lead a conference, and I took her on a safari one weekend, and we were in the Land Rover going through the African Veld, and I was witnessing to this German couple who just sliced me to shreds. I mean, I have never run into such hostility of the gospel in my life. And I went back to my room that night, and I was saying, God, what have I done wrong that I used the wrong verse, the wrong tact? And, and it came to me, maybe it wasn't for them, it was for my daughter, that she would hear me sharing the gospel and seeing me stand up for it, even when I ran into such hostility, not backing down from the truth. And when have your children heard you personally sharing the gospel? You know, I don't just listen to my daddy in the pulpit. I listen to him in private. And I've heard him sharing the gospel one-on-one. -on -one. And I've heard him praying and reading the scriptures. And I've, I've seen his heart for the gospel. He lives it and breathes it. It's not something he puts on for a platform. No wonder he's passed the reality of his faith in Jesus to the next generation and the next generation. Now he's got great-grandchildren he's passing it to. Phoniness is a fire quencher. There's something else the Lord said to me from this letter, and I'll just tuck it in for what it's worth. When he said, I know your deeds, you have a reputation for being alive and you're dead. The Lord has said that to me in the last 12 years. And I was going around speaking everywhere. And he said right from this letter, Anne, you have a reputation for being alive, a reputation for being a woman of the word. But as I see you, you're dying. And you know why? Because I was prayerless. I wasn't spending time in prayer. I was too tired. And I have a prayer team, eight women at home, that pray for me every day on their own. Once a week, they come together and pray. When I speak, they pray and fast, call each other on the phone, pray for me on the phone while I'm speaking. Right now, they do that in the middle of the night because... You know, the time change and all that that can put it in a crazy time back in the eastern part of the United States, but, but they figure out the time change and, and they're praying for me during this message. And so sometimes I would rely on their prayers instead of my own prayers and I would just spend time in the Word. I wasn't praying. I was prayerless. And the Lord said, Ann, you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dying. You're shriveling up because of prayerlessness. Is there somebody here is prayerless. You used to spend time in prayer, not just going down your shopping list, you know, all the things you want God to do for you, but spending time just worshiping Him, praising Him, just enjoying His presence, just talking to Him about your day and letting Him know what's on your heart. He knows all of that, but when we come to Him in prayer like that, we're developing a personal relationship with Him. Prayerlessness phoniness or fire quenchers. And so the, Jesus says, listen to me. And I think the principle is this, that he's not fooled by our reputation, is he? <laughs> he looks on our hearts and he sees the reality of our faith and the fact that we're not passing it on because perhaps we're hypocritical or we're prayerless. And so he says, listen to me. He has a promise for us. The one in verse 5, the one who overcomes will be dressed in white. 
meaning he'll be right with God. I'll never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He's promising you and me a personal, permanent love relationship with himself. And out of that love relationship stems everything in our Christian lives. It's the heartbeat. It's the wellspring. It's the anchor. It's that which flows from us to our families and our neighbors and our churches. That's what's going to pass on our faith to the next generation. It's the reality of our love and our faith and our obedience and our walk with Him. And we're just real. And if you're put on a mask tonight, if you're coming pretending, would you just drop it? And maybe you would say, Anne, I'm scared to death for people to see me like I really am and to see the sin in my life and see my struggles and my frailties and I'm not as spiritual as people think they are. But you know, if you drop the mask and then you begin to really work at it and you start praying and spending time in your Bible and you start obeying, they're going to see that maybe this week you lost your temper, next week you lose it less, the next week you have victory over it, and they're going to think, you know, if God can help her control her temper, he can do the same for me. And we begin to show each other the reality of the power of Christ. But how can people see that if we just go around pretending all the time? Would you be real and get on your knees, make time for prayer? I remember great old Dr. Alan Redpath saying to an American audience, he said, you know what American Christians need? He said they need blanket victory, just victory over those blankets in the morning, getting up so that you can spend time on your knees in prayer. Now, I've prayed for blanket victory again and again. I think I've been defeated more than I've been victorious. The victory for me is that I keep on trying, keep on getting up, keep on spending time with the Lord in prayer, that I would be real in my relationship with Him. Are you listening to what the Spirit is saying? Prayerlessness is a fire quencher. Phoniness is a fire quencher. The church at Sardis was not listening to the Spirit. There's nothing but ruins there today. There's no Christian church in Sardis. The next church is the church at Philadelphia. There was no fire quencher in Philadelphia. They were doing everything right. Praise God. Precious people. Look forward to meeting them someday. I see a tendency in their lives to be timid in their service because they were afraid to walk through the open door, but, uh, but they did. The last one I want to touch on is the church at Laodicea that has the fire quencher of pride. And Jesus begins saying, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And he begins by saying, look at me, I'm the truth. And the Laodiceans needed to look because when he finishes with this letter, they're going to doubt what he's saying because it was so contrary to their view of themselves. So he begins by saying, my words are true. Listen to me, I'm giving a faithful witness. Learn from me, I know your deeds. I know what you're doing right. Nothing. There wasn't one thing in this church that was pleasing to God. I know what you're doing wrong, everything. And this is why everything was wrong. Number one, they were indifferent to Christ. I know your deeds, you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Because if you were hot, I could use you. If you're cold, you, I could use you. I can't use something lukewarm. Because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Just made Jesus sick. And it's, he wanted to use them for his kingdom. He wanted to use them for his glory. He wanted to use them to present the gospel to the world. But they were indifferent towards him and he couldn't use them. You remember when he passed that fig tree on his way to Jerusalem and it had lots of leaves but no figs? And he cursed it. Just like today he gets angry when we have a leafy profession but no figs of real faith. And it's the same principle in John chapter 15 when the branch that doesn't bear fruit, he purges, he takes away. He wants to use you and me. He wants us to be for his glory. He wants us to present the gospel to the world around us. He wants us to be to conform to the image of Christ. He wants us to be fruitful in our character. And when we're not, it makes him sick. And so he says, you're indifferent to me. You're lukewarm. I can't use you. And then he says, not only indifferent to me, but you're ignorant of your condition. You say I'm rich. They thought they had eternal life. I've acquired wealth. I have all the blessings of God. I don't need anything. And yet you don't realize that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. They had never even been born again. 
They had substituted a religion for a personal relationship with God. And so Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, buy from me real salvation, that you can become rich and have white clothes to wear the righteousness of Christ to clothe you, that you can cover your shameful nakedness, salve of the Holy Spirit to put on your eyes so you can see the truthfulness of your condition. Oh, listen to me. I don't believe this is for everybody here, but I believe it's for somebody here because the Lord's put it on my heart. Is there somebody here born and raised in the church, baptized as an infant, confirmed as a young adult? You take the sacraments, you go to church every Sunday, you're involved. You may be a deacon or an elder involved in leadership of the church, but you have never been born again. Nicodemus was the greatest religious leader in Israel. He was a household name. Everybody knew Nicodemus. He fasted three times a week. He knew the scriptures inside and out. He kept the law meticulously. And he came to Jesus and said, Jesus, just tell me a little bit about heaven. And Jesus looked at Nicodemus, this great religious leader, and he said, Nicodemus, you're never even going to see heaven, much less enter it, unless you are born again. Religion doesn't make it, friends. Doesn't matter how religious you are. You have to have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And the Laodiceans were so proud in their religion, in their traditions, in their rituals, in their church denomination, that they had never humbled themselves and confessed that they were a sinner and come to the foot of the cross and repented of their sin and received Christ as their Savior. Jesus says in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Oh, the Lord loved the Laodiceans. And listen to me. He loves you, and he loves you, and he loves you, whoever you are. Proud, religious person, steeped in tradition and rituals. And the Lord God has drawn you to Keswick this week to tell you that he loves you, but he counsels you to be born again. Repent of your pride. Verse 20, it's so familiar, isn't it? But just think this was given to the church. This was given to religious people. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He was on the outside of the church, locked out, knocking to be let in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Is he locked out of your heart? Why? Pride, maybe there's something else. Maybe there's a deep grievance in your life. Anger towards God because of something he's allowed, a suffering, an injustice, an abuse. Maybe there's an unforgiveness towards someone and you've locked your heart and it's tight and it's hard. Whatever it is, he says, I'm knocking at your heart's door tonight. And if you would open the door of your heart and let him come in, he says he will come in. You know, sup with you and you with him. That's the promise of fellowship with the living God, knowing him in a personal love relationship. You're listening to what the Spirit is saying. And the principle is this. You must be born again. That's not a Baptist thing. <laughs> That's not a Billy Graham evangelistic crusade thing. That's what Jesus said. John chapter 3. You must be born again. That's not an option. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to receive eternal life, if you want to be right with God, you must be born again. And the promise is this. Verse 21, to the one who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. In other words, I'm going to give you the right to be accepted in heaven. You will be as accepted in heaven as Jesus is. Can you imagine? Doesn't matter who you are, what you've done. When you come to the cross by faith and you confess your sin and you repent and you receive him into your life, you're washed clean of your sin, you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and when heaven's door opens, you're as welcomed as Jesus is. Now that's a promise. Are you listening to what the Spirit is saying? Pride is a fire quencher. The church at Laodicea refused to listen. There's no church there today. 
So my challenge to you on this first night of the convention, would you examine your heart and your life for the fire quenchers, things that put the fire out. And if you would examine your heart on this first night and bring it to the cross and confess it as the sin that it is and repent and ask God to help you, I believe he's going to use the rest of the convention to light the fire until the time you leave here, you're going to be on fire. And God willing, the fire will spread. And maybe once again, in our day, we'll have revival. Would you listen to what the Spirit is saying? Would you pray with me, please? I want to take just a moment to speak to that one person who has come and you know that you have never been born again. And I just invite you right now at this moment to pray this simple prayer after me, just quietly in your heart. Dear God, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. And I confess my pride that's kept me from the cross. And I'm sorry. And I'm willing to repent of my sin. And I come humbly to the cross. I believe Jesus died for me. And I believe Jesus rose up from the dead to give me eternal life. And right now, dear God, I open the door of my heart and I invite Jesus to come live inside of me as my Savior, as my Lord. And from this day forward, I seek to live my life in the power of his Spirit. And if you've prayed a prayer something like that, the words don't exactly matter. It's just the faith in your heart. You place your faith in God's word. But I encourage you to seek out a counselor behind this platform, one of those in leadership at this convention. Share with them the decision you've made. Ask them to pray with you. You will be giving them the highest privilege they'll have all week if you'll let them pray with you and for you. And there are many, many of you here, like me, who have allowed fire quenchers to creep into your life. And maybe we haven't mentioned the one that has put the fire out in your heart, but God has brought it to your mind. Would you confess it? And would you repent? And bring that sin to the cross and crucify it. And start afresh. And use this wonderful Keswick Convention to put you back on your feet on fire, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, fanning into flame the gift that God has given you. So, Father, we want to thank you for the gift. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, your power living in us. And we just ask, dear God, that you would show us how to let him loose, <laughs> give him full control, totally yielding our lives to him, that we might be on fire for you, and that other people, when they look at us, would see our passion and our love for Jesus, and they would see the reality of our faith as we spend time in prayer and in your word and sharing the gospel. And they see that we're not phonies, we're real. We're prayer warriors, and Lord God, they see that although we're not perfect, We've crucified our pride and humbled ourselves and we've been born again. And we're the real thing, a child of God, saved by your grace on our way to heaven, seeking with all of our ability to live for you a life that's contagious. And so I just pray now, dear God, that you would take this message and you would put it deep into our hearts, brand it on us, that we would think it over, that you would bring it back to our minds, that we would continue to listen to the voice of the Spirit speaking to us. And we thank you for this wonderful week. And we ask that you would use it to just keep the fire burning. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, the one on whom this week and every week for the rest of our lives we keep our focus Keep looking at Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.
Amen.